Hello, everybody, and welcome to Amaze on Stream. This week, I am so excited to introduce you guys to Seth Roman, who is the Chief Revenue Officer for Yardline. Seth, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Melissa. So one of the things that I talk about probably every podcast is that the format for this one is really about people, getting to know people and using that as inspiration for not only knowing the people behind the services so that we can make better choices when we are um, hiring our services, but also getting inspired and motivated to see, you know, the different places people start and where they end up. So I want to dive right in and get started with your parents. So when you were growing up, your parents, uh, I imagine, were a pretty big influence on you. Were they also entrepreneurs or what What did they do for a living? Um, they, they actually were a, a combination of risk-taking entrepreneurs um, and very conservative, um, you know, frugal, if you will, um, with, with, you know, trying to play things safe. So um, my, my dad professionally was an accountant. Um, and he was the controller at a few different magazines um, and then also um, later worked at a law firm. Um, but while I was probably somewhere around first, second grade, um, my parents decided to open up a business in, in the town we grew up in. We grew up in a town called Marlboro in central New Jersey, uh, central New Jersey. It's called uh, Marlboro? Marlboro, like the cigarettes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, 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 um, my, my mom's family was always there. Their, the family business on my mom's side was was in the bridal industry. And so my, my grandparents owned a bridal store um, that was in uh, Queens and was successful. And they later sold it. Uh, well, later sold it way before I was born. Um, and, and, you know, sometime when I was around first or second grade, my parents opened a bridal store in Marlboro. And, um, you know, it was if you told me that now, I would say no way that was my parents because my dad was always um, the nine to five, um, you know, worker. He he commuted from central New Jersey, where the cost of living is far less expensive than other parts around New York City, into Manhattan every day, um, you know, two hours each way um, to work. Oh, a, that's a rough commute. <laughs> yeah, to, to work as an accountant, essentially. And, um, you know, this is, this is as, as far back as I can remember until the um, you know, he retired early um, due to medical issues, but, um, you know, that was always what, what he did. And, and so my mom ran the business uh, Monday through Friday and my dad would come at night or, or on the weekends and help. And so growing up, I was always seeing this business and I was always watching it operate and grow. And I saw, you know, the upside of when there were really good times for, for their business. And then, um, you know, I, I also saw the downside, which was, you know, one day I think I was probably, you know, I don't know, the business was less than 10 years old, but somewhere in that five to 10 year old range. And, um, you know, my, my father pulled me aside. He's like, yeah, we closed the business. And, you know, this was after hearing that things were so successful, but understanding oh, that, my goodness. that the business failed ultimately due to, you know, competition, which, which, which happens. And, and they were sort of this boutique higher end bridal shop and, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I know when, when my wife and I got married, she bought an inexpensive gown because she was going to wear it once and didn't find, find the need to spend a lot of money on, on it. So, right. um, you know, it, and, and that's just the, the, the nature of the times. Right. And so, you know, seeing my parents, though, um, both as these entrepreneurs, but also my, my dad being a very conservative person who, who, who worked really, really hard just to make sure he had enough money coming in mm. so we could pay the mortgage and pay the bills sort of, I think, gave me this dilemma or, or balance or whatever you want to call it of really trying to navigate both the safe and easy route and the risky and entrepreneurial route. Right. Yeah. Because there's always this question as an entrepreneur, like, is it like, is it the safer option for most people who do the nine to five jobs and they're used to having, you know, just a regular, they're used to being an employee there's a feeling of safety and security that comes from that because someone else is responsible for making sure you get paid. But then there's yep. also, you, you balance this risk of someone else is really in charge of your future and they can terminate you at any time. And, and so there's some risky business there too. For sure. Um, so then I think some entrepreneurs feel like it's actually safer to run your own business, but then there's whew, entrepreneurial roller coaster. <laughs> right. There's ups and downs and, 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 you know, obviously 
you know, in this day and age, you see that more than anything. Oh, yeah. Well, and so it sounds like you really got a good look at both sides of things so that entering into your, you know, school years and, you know, later on, you had the ability to see the result of each of those and the result of the combination, which I think is, is unique. Most of the people that I interview on this, they have seen one side or the other, and either they'll do the total opposite than their parents did, or they will, um, they'll say, okay, I'm going to do it just like them. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think, I think for myself, you know, growing up and when I did and the timing of, you know, I graduated college in 2005, right before the, the great recession. And so, um, you know, going into the world at that time and the workforce at that time, um, and then seeing what happened in 2008 and 2009 really helped mold my, my view on things and, and, and um, you know, seeing both what happened to my parents when they lost their business, um, as well as other non-business or non-financial things, seeing, seeing, you know, family members go through health stuff and, and you know, loss of life really puts a lot of things in perspective and gives, gives, gives you the opportunity to um, realize that even in the worst case scenario, which I think, uh, you know, um, is what's so good about the entrepreneurial spirit, right? When things go as bad as they possibly could, you always get through it, right? And you always can move on to the next thing, regardless of your financial situation um, or your health situation, right? There's always the next chapter. That is so well put. And I think what's interesting about that is, you know, some people feel like, um, I, I don't know what to do next. I, I'm paralyzed uh, with fear by, you know, taking an action. You know, what what to do is making this next move impossible to decide on. But in fact, not making a move is making a decision. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, kind of a, an interesting an interesting thing. I, I love how you put that. So, um, all right. So your parents had this awesome mix so you got to see both sides. How was um, like school and stuff like that going into school? Had you decided you wanted to go to college? Was there expectations maybe from your family or how did that yeah. look? So, so we, we, we were fortunate enough that our parents said, my, my, me and my brother, our parents said that, um, you know, so long as you do well in school, um, we will pay for college. And so I remember vividly my brother going, and again, we, we grew up in central New Jersey. My brother went with my parents. They looked at Syracuse. Um, and uh, once they saw what the price tag was, they said, we'll pay for Rutgers, which is the, the state school, which is far less expensive than Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so my experience of looking at college and, and thinking about college was, was pretty binary. Um, it was either I was going to go to Rutgers where my parents would pay first school or, or um, you know, I would look at, you know, going right into the workforce or even, you know, some sort of trade um, or technical school um, to do something very specific. But again, I didn't really have um, a, a very specific focus on what I wanted to do. Um, we, we were always working when we were younger. Um, you know, I started working before I was, you know, legally of age to, to get working papers um, and, and, you know, even as kids, me and my brother would go house to house, shoveling snow, doing whatever we could to, you know, make an extra five or $10 so that we can, uh, you know, spend it on whatever we would spend it on. Yeah. Um, and, and so, um, you know, when I applied to school, I applied to Rutgers and nowhere else saying, if I don't get into Rutgers, um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll figure it out. I'll worry about it then. And that's, that, you know, my <laughs> wife would tell you that's, that's, a, that's, that's pretty much how I operate today. You know, I don't, I don't like to worry about things until, until um, it really matters until there's something to worry about. So that's probably uh, really good for your stress level. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, it's, it's good for my stress level. It's terrible for hers, but and she's a consultant. So she's very, very much focused on, you know, being organized and knowing what's going to happen and when it's going to happen to the best <laughs> of her ability. Um, but, but we balance out pretty well there. Um, but, um, you know, when, when I applied to, to Rutgers, I actually applied, you, you, Rutgers is, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Rutgers, but it's, it's a pretty big school. It's a state school. Um, at the time, I think there was like 40,000 undergraduate students. Wow. At Rutgers. Uh, and they have, you know, I'm talking about the main, the main college in New Brunswick. There, there are four or five different campuses and actually, I think it's four or five different colleges within the university. And so you could apply to individual schools. And I, I, I applied to both the main, the main university as well as um, the engineering program. And, and so um, I was accepted into the engineering program thinking that was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I'd go, uh, you know, I think at, at the time, my dad 
was 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 the controller um, for a very prominent patent attorney office, and mm. and so um, what really interested me in that was my dad was doing the tax returns for all the partners and 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 uh, as well as the day to day accounting for the firm, and he would show me or tell me you know what the partners would take home, and the numbers were just mind blowing to me. I didn't even think that it was possible for somebody to go through the normal course of get an education, go into the workforce and make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw those dollars and my eyes got really big. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, for me, money has always been a, a tremendous motivator. And, mm -hmm. and so I saw that as an opportunity to say, well, I, what interests me? And understanding that, you know, at the time in, in, in high school, electrical engineering was something of interest and understanding, you know, my dad really taught me that what a patent attorney is, is somebody that is both an engineer and an attorney that uses that mixed background to um, provide services to, to the patent world, right? Um, patenting things and, and understanding trademarks and all that sort. And so, you know, I saw that as an opportunity to take what I, what interests me, which was electrical engineering at the time, go to Rutgers and get a degree in electrical engineering. Um, what, what I didn't anticipate was the level of um, math and science that was needed. And I'm always more geared towards the math side of education. I'm, I'm definitely more of a numbers person than I am yeah. of, a, a, of a, a literature or historian. Um, but, um, you know, I think I, it was probably Calc 2 or 3 where I said, I just can't do this. I, you know, I got to get to Calc 4. I reached my ceiling. <laughs> I, I got to get to Calc 4. And, and, you know, I also was certainly at a point in my life where I wanted to you know, learn more about who I was and, and enjoy yeah. the college atmosphere beyond just the educational side. Yeah. So um, it, it was actually at that time that my, my dad came to me and said, you know, do you really want to keep doing this? If not, let's open a business together. And so. And so how um, old are you at this point and how many years into college are you? I was probably in my sophomore year. So I was probably 19, right. um, 19, 20 years old, somewhere around there. And um, at, at the time, I sat there and I really, really thought about dropping out and starting a business with my dad. And, you know, at the time we were talking about different franchises, like fast food franchises or you know, what we can do that would be sort of a uh, turnkey business we can either acquire or, or get into. And, um, you know, after after much back and forth about it, um, you know. And, and seeing where my older brother was at the time. So my brother is two years older than me, um, also ended up at Rutgers. Um, and it's so, just so, the two of you guys? Just the like, two of us, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so my brother, right out of college, was working for Lehman Brothers, um, which, you know, at the time wow. was one of the, uh, the top, um, you know, investment banking firms. And, yeah, and it's that's not a big time. deal. So it's like, big this was before the suit. collapse, right? And, and so... <laughs> Again, I was sort of put back into these two different dilemmas that I would face mm -hmm. as a child, or that I saw as a child, which was seeing my brother take the same education path. By this time, I was, I was now um, focusing on my degree in economics, um, which was what he graduated in. Seeing him go down the path of graduating with that degree, getting an entry-level job at Lehman Brothers and working mm -hmm. his way up to being you know, really, really successful there um, and, and, and being able to make not, you know, good a good income for his age you know a few years out of college mm -hmm. um versus going back to the entrepreneurial route and and right. and seeing you know the opportunity that my dad was open to right i think i was very fortunate that my dad looked at um you know my perception of college and said if it's not for you he didn't want to force it i think selfishly he didn't want to keep paying for tuition he'd rather take that money and pay it somewhere else but um you know i think i think at that point um, I was I was looking at the two paths and um, I saw what my brother was doing and I said, I can do if my brother can do it, I can do that. We were very competitive. So 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 that's sort of how I looked at it. And um, the end result was I, I stayed in school and I, I, I got my degree in economics and, um, and and actually coming out of college, Lehman Brothers still, you know, you're talking about 2005 was my dream job. That was where I wanted to be. And so, so it's interesting to me, um, sorry to, to jump in here, but 
I mean, I've, I've got to say, there are not a lot of interviews I've had where people have said, my dad asked me if I wanted to drop out of college and become an entrepreneur. Usually, like, it's so very common, I think, for families to say, what are you doing? Like, you're going to ruin everything. You, you, you've got to have the security. You've got to, you know, are you sure about this? this is it too risky? You, you, sh you should do something that's more of a sure bet. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously, you were very, very fortunate to have your dad come in and um, not only be okay with you potentially dropping out, but be supportive of either decision and willing to financially back you in, in either case, which is, I mean, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, well, I mean, I think at the, at the end of the day, either way, I'm indebted to him for life. So there, right. that, that sort of was the underlying. I mean, that's sort of a standing. Of, 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 yeah, of course. And, and, and it was great <laughs> to have that type of support from both my father right. and my mother. My oh, mother yeah. was fully supportive, um, you know, as well. Um, maybe not when all of my grades came through at different times in my life, but um, overall, you know, they, they wanted what was best for us. Yeah, that's, that's really great. So, all right. So then you decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to carry on with college. I'm going to, you know, see this through and you got yep. your degree. I got my degree. And so what um, age were you when you graduated? 22, I, I guess, 22, 23, some yeah. 22, 22, I think is when, when you graduate. For the most part. And did you have an idea like you now you wanted to get the job there at Lehman Brothers, right? I wanted to work at Lehman Brothers. Um, and, and so Lehman Brothers at the time actually was recruiting heavily out of Rutgers. You know, mm -hmm. I think Rutgers is the closest universities to, to downtown New York City. It, it's it's, you know, a stone's throw across the, the Hudson River and, um, you know, one of the de probably definitely the largest um you know, university in proximity to New York City by, you know, population, right, by, mm -hmm. by the number of students. So um, Rutgers Business School is great. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, a great program they have. And I think Lehman Brothers heavily recruited out of Rutgers. And um, my brother got me the ability actually before I even graduated um, to interview a few times um, for a summer internship. And that was oh, his best. Great. He took a summer internship and he used that to get a full-time position when he graduated. And so um, I, I, I vividly remember going into an interview for, for a summer internship, internship, probably before my senior year of high uh, of college and just being terrible. I was, I, I was just a terrible, <laughs> it was, I was terrible. I would not have hired me if I was in there for that summer internship. And, um, oh my the, gosh. the interviewer felt the same. So I did not get, <laughs> I did not get it, which made me want it that much more. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously throughout life, you refine your skills through each passing moment and, you know, through different jobs and through different interviews and, and all that. Um, but more than anything, when I graduated, I just wanted to have the security of a job immediately, right? Yeah. I wanted to immediately be able to go out and pay my own bills, rent my own apartment, do whatever it was I needed to be as independent as possible. Um, because of one, the proximity from where my parents lived to New York City, you know, I did not want to have to do that commute on a regular yeah. basis. Um, and, and, and two, just being able to have that freedom and, and, and being able to go out when you want to go out and, 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 you know, buy something when you wanted to buy something, you know, yeah. that was, that well, was something and that's that sort I of saw. Like a life milestone, right? When you, you get that freedom, you have your own place, you have, you know, your own job security or financial freedom in some capacity, um, that that move out from the parents' house and that like separation from, um, you know, now I'm in charge of everything all the time, all by myself. That's a, a whole different way to view the world when you get to that point. For sure. Sure. <laughs> and, 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 you know, um, once I, before I even graduated, I, I, I was able to get a job. I had a job with Citibank, Citibank North America, which um, may, the main office is in Long Island City, Queens, which mm. we thought the commute from, Central New Jersey to Manhattan was tough. Add another half an hour uh, onto it by having to get out, you know, transfer to a new train and get out oh, to Queens. No. But, um, you know, I, I didn't care. I just wanted to get a job in the finance world as soon yeah. as possible. And, and I got an offer. Um, it was, it was, it, I didn't care what it was doing. I, I said to myself, whatever it is, I'll figure it out. And if I don't like it, I'll figure out my way of how to navigate through the network. And yeah on up and into into something better that I want to do and so um, I took that job and um, I think it was probably end of 2006 that they started having layoffs and started mm -hmm. having issues 
And I was not going to get laid off. I did not make nearly enough money for anybody to care about letting me <laughs> off. Um, and, I, and, and I enjoyed the work, but it wasn't as financial focused as I liked. It was more um, rewards and like, um, right. you know, the, the credit card reward programs and stuff like that was more of the focus of it. And so um, I, I, as soon as my boss at the time, who, who I had only worked with for a short period of time, yeah. less than a year, um, had received an early retirement package um, due to everything that was going on, um, I decided I, 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 I didn't want to be at the big city bank financial institution anymore. I, it was time yeah. for me to find something that really um, was, was more in line with me as an individual and, and, and met my personal needs better. And that and was so what- So can I ask, um, at this time, when you're, when you're struggling with this and you know, this is sort of the horizon uh, and, and the worldview in your, your area, um, were you, had you met your wife yet? Had, were you guys no. dating? Oh, okay. So this is pre everything. <laughs> this, this is, this is, this is, you know, uh, within a year of graduating college, you know, um, it, you know, and still commuting, literally commuting, waking up, getting on a bus, um, at, at, at you know, seven before 7.00 AM I'm on the bus to, to, to get to Queens okay. by 9.00 AM. Um, and you know, doing the same thing, going home, not getting home till eight, nine o'clock at night, just knowing that um, I was, you know, going in the direction of this is what it's going to take to get to the next right. step. Yeah. Oh, that's rough. Okay. So yeah. then what did you decide to do after, uh, you know, things are, are kind of the writings on the wall, so to speak? Yeah. So, so, so by a um, complete um, coincidence, I, not coincidence, but by, 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 me going out and um, my aunt who, who passed away um, nearly 10 years ago at this point, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when she found out that I was looking for a new job, um, she did what she would do for anyone, which was immediately do everything she can to find me a job. And so <laughs> she stood up, she stood up in her office and said, my nephew's looking for a new job in New York. You know, she was, she was working in, in New Jersey at the time. And, and, and somebody there said, Oh, my, my boyfriend, works for this new financial company that um, is focused on lending um, uh -huh. or it, it wasn't really lending, but focused on um, finance and, um, you know, said, why don't you, you connect him with my boyfriend? And I connected with him and um, I found out about this non-bank lending world um, very shortly thereafter. And, and um, it was my first, um, step towards getting to where I am today professionally and understanding the world that I work in um, now at Yardlock. Mm -hmm. So now this, this must have been a whole different thing because especially even at that time, just things are still moving in the digital direction and like the online purchasing and stuff like that. And this is very, very young for that kind of stuff. Um, even. Yeah. So the company was called Merchant Cash and Capital. It was, it was, the company itself was founded in 2005. Um, so, so, you know, at this point, the company was a year old, give or take. Yeah. Um, and when I walked into the office, it was on, you know, 31st and Park Avenue, um, great location. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I walked into essentially a room that was, you know, a dozen 22 year olds uh, <laughs> that were sitting around, um, essentially underwriting and selling um, small business loans. Um, mm -hmm. They weren't actually loans, but, but for simplicity, there were small business loans. And so, um, you know, I met with the, the, the CEO and I met with the COO and um, I told them, I was like, look, I'm, I'm at Citibank right now and I'm looking to make a change. You know, in my mind, I thought I was doing this whole um, great transition away from the big corporation to go to a small company. Um, but really it wasn't about that for me. It was really about being in an environment where I had the ability to do something that impacted mm -hmm. the actual business, right? Oh, that's great. And you had more direct contact then with the, the people who were getting the small business loans, like the customers. Yeah, I mean, at Citibank, I was one of thousands of employees right. where I didn't have external conversations, right? I mean, keep in mind, this was way before Slack. Um, this is, you know, when, when if, if you remember back, you know, Citibank had their own internal systems, right? Like the computers, I, I don't even think they had windows at the time. I'm, I'm sure they had <laughs> windows, but um, you, know, you know, I don't think you had the ability to do much on the computer because of how, how 
how regulated everything was. And so, right. um, you know, I, I then saw and understood that here was a room full of, of people my age um, that were um, working and communicating directly with small business owners that were looking for financing to grow their business. And that was, that was my first experience, um, you know, looking at it and saying, okay, not only do I make the decisions of whether or not we will provide them with financing, but I get to talk to these customers directly, understand how their business starts to work and how they're operating, understand what they need the financing for and then what they're going to do with it and, and, and yeah. being able to see how, how that um, works over time. Oh, that's amazing. So, so then what happened? Because that, um, how long did that um, period of time work out? Because this, this was a, a new company and uh, startups can be fun. Yeah, so <laughs> it was actually, actually a, a great long trip. Um, Merchant Cash and Capital later rebranded to BizFi um, that sold off in um, mid-2017. So you're wow. talking over 10 years I was there. And, and I started um, on the underwriting side. And really what we were doing on the underwriting side was looking at all the businesses that were applying with us for financing and deciding if we wanted to approve them or not. Yeah. And if we wanted to approve them, what we were going to qualify them for. And so over time, um, you know, I, I, I grew, uh, I learned a lot as an underwriter um, and, and through communicating directly with, with these merchants and the business owners. Um, and later ran that division until I got to the point where it was, you know, time for me to figure out what else I could do. Yeah. And so, you know, probably three or four years of doing and running the underwriting side, um, I ended up starting what was essentially the business development department, which was going out there and finding partners and finding brokers that we could work with to drive more business to merchant cash and capital. Right. So that was my first foray into what was really a titled position of sales. I think, I think as you know, entrepreneurs and as, as business people, everyone's a salesperson, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of really understanding and identifying when you come to terms with that and, and, and really understand yeah. you know, when, you, when you really embrace it or shy away from it. And, and at that point, um, you know, up until that point, even before you know, starting at Merchant Cash and Capital throughout college and high school, I was always working a job where there was some level of sales. I just didn't acknowledge it as being a salesperson, right? Right. Uh, I mean, you're so right. I just, I have to pause this because that is so true. Like those words, they, you said them like, it's like nothing, but I got to say if, if, you know, the people listening did not hear that it's you, I think that is so, so um, insightful to, uh, to just put that into very simple words at every level, like entrepreneurs, people, employees, everyone in general, humans <laughs> are um, at some level, salespeople, you have to, you're always selling yourself and you can either um, acknowledge it and embrace it or you can shy away from it, but it doesn't make it not true. Even if you shy away yeah. from it, it just means you're doing a worse job, right? Yeah, and, 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 and I remember the first time I was compensated for making a sale. And it was while I was in college, I was working at a liquor store a wine shop, Wegman's Wine Shop in Manalpin, uh, New Jersey, um, where, you know, it, I was a clerk. I, I would um, restock the shelves, check people out, take out the cardboard, do whatever, you know. Um, but every once in a while, the vendors would come in and they'd run sales contests for us, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever sells the most, this bottle of wine or tequila or whatever it is, you know, gets a free bottle. And, and I just remember, um, I think I won every one, right? Just because mm -hmm. Um, you know, people would always tell me I had the gift of gab and I'm a very, you know, sociable person. I like talking to people. Um, yeah. I, I always have. And, um, you know, I think, I think um, it wasn't until that point that, you know, I realized that if I wanted to, right, I could be successful um, in, in, in selling a product or a good, right. A specific right. one to somebody that, that not, not, I wouldn't say wouldn't want it, but maybe they didn't know that that was something that they would, be willing to try. Right. That's very interesting. It's, you know, these are, this is why I, I honestly love doing these um, interviews and, and learning about people because there's these moments, I think, um, throughout your life where you do something either out of necessity or just it's your job or something like that, but you actually learn something about yourself, which the whole concept of learning more about yourself is so interesting to me. It means so many different things. It means you have to be open to, um, 
to finding something out and admitting it to yourself, you know, whether it's good or bad. And it means, you know, that, um, that it's okay to not have it all figured out from the get go, including yourself, which is, I, I think that's such an important thing for people to know, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so what happened next? You're, you're um, so, working. So, so, so Merchant Cancer Capital becomes BizFi. We were right. granted to BizFi. And, and we went from being a funding company that was helping small businesses get access to capital. And this was going from pre-recession, right? Before the Great Recession, where um, it, it was very easy to go to a bank and get access to money if you are a small business to right. um, post-recession where it's impossible, right? And this mm -hmm. was sort of the emergence of non-bank lenders, non-bank funding companies. And we were already established beforehand um, but this sort of just accelerated things to the next level um, when you had all of these businesses and all of these operators um, and later now all of these sellers and e-commerce businesses and operators mm -hmm. that are looking for access to capital um, and, and you know, our, our parents and grandparents would say, okay, well, when you need money, you go to the bank, but that was right. no longer an option. So, so you saw both on the consumer and on the commercial side, all of these new options of how you tap into um, financing, how you get additional capital. And so um, BizFi rebranded and became um, essentially one of the largest online platforms for small businesses to go to, wow. where you can not only find out what we would offer you if you wanted to get funding from us, but also all of our competitors. And, and we, wow. we, we not only saw, and this was, this was a big thing for me, I think, you know, something that my old CEO, um, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Steve Scheinbaum, he, he, he sort of didn't look at a competitor and say they're the enemy, right? He looked at all of our competitors and say, how can we work with them, right? How mm -hmm. can we, you know, take any clients that come to us that doesn't want our product or, or maybe we're not the best fit for them and connect them to our competitors so that way we can help them find the best product. For them. That's or, or such a great things. viewpoint. Like what a great perspective. Absolutely. And, and so... BizFi was now launched as an online platform for small businesses to find out what we would qualify them for, where they can quickly and easily access our capital or what our competitors could get them qualified for and tap into those resources as well. Right. And so um, it, it was the beginning and, you know, we, we were calling ourselves a fintech company for quite some time, but it wasn't really until that point where we launched this online marketplace that we truly were leveraging technology um, to make financing more easily available to our customers. And so, you know, that was really the beginning of the chapter of, you know, I think where we crossed from being a, you know, a, a non-bank finance company that did X, Y, Z to really becoming a FinTech company. And that was really, um, you know, I think a, a turning point for most of the businesses in that space, you know, building out different um, connections and APIs that you can tap into to help elevate the customer's experience. And, um, make the process better. Oh, and so, well. It sounds yeah, like, I mean, it was very cutting edge, especially for that time. How, how do you think that influenced the choices you were going to make next by being on something that was so cutting edge and like really, I mean, that was, that was really the, the start of things. Yeah, and, and I think that seeing how much technology can really impact a non-technology focused business Right. right. Really, really showed me that you need to embrace change. And, and I think wow. me as a salesperson, I think most people are afraid of change. It's just innate, especially when you have a good thing going, you're afraid to change. But at oh, the yeah. same time, if you don't if you don't change, if you don't adapt, then you'll go the way of the dinosaur. So it's sort of playing with that balance of being able to take risk when there is the uh, you know opportunity for change. Um, but not being so foolish that you throw caution to the wind and put yourself in a dire position. So, sure. yeah, you know, that's as, a hard as, balance. Yeah, and, and so as as we embrace that change, um, I also um, moved internally from what was um, running the business development program to really running the direct sales team, which was um, one of the largest sales teams in the space. We had nearly a hundred salespeople wow. in New York City. Um, you know, essentially you know, interacting directly with the small businesses that were looking for financing and helping them navigate which options they should take and um, connecting them with the product that was best for them. So where in here did you meet your wife? This is what I want to know. Oh, 
Uh, so, so I actually didn't meet my wife until um, after BizFi sold off. And so, but, oh, wow. but, but who I did meet at BizFi um, was our, you know, he, he, he similarly followed my path, which was coming in on the underwriting side, running underwriting for a while. Um, and where I went to run the sales side of the business, he went and ran the operations side of the business. So huh? Tomo Matsuo, um, who I believe you met um, in, in New York when, when you were out here, um, you know, he um, was the COO for BizFi um, for the last few years before wow. the business sold. And so we, we, we had worked very closely together, obviously myself on the sales side, him on the operations side, got to know each other very well. Um, and um, that was where our connection started and obviously not where it finished um, because we did keep in touch after the sale um, and obviously reconnected uh, a little more than a year ago when, when, when your line started. So, so uh, how, what, how did that transpire? Like, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you guys are sort of like you're in touch, but that, you know. I'm in touch yeah. with a few people I worked with, you know, 10 years ago in Arizona or something like that, but that there must have been some kind of conversation or idea. What did that look like? So, so um, when, when, when BizFi sold, um, I was very fortunate enough that I was able to take a bunch of my sales reps with me to a competitor um, that rebranded and is currently called Capitus. Um, and there's, they're one of the largest, um, finance companies that are focused on traditional um, brick and mortar. And, and actually they have a big focus on healthcare, financing healthcare businesses um, and, and construction businesses and, and, and other sort of um, offline businesses uh, as opposed right. to what we're used to. Um, and, and so um, while I was there immediately after the BizFi sale, um, Tomo uh, was at a company called Paysmith and he just so happened to be in an office that was you know, one block away from the Capitus offices. And so um, <laughs> we'd run into each other randomly at Starbucks, getting coffee, or even just walking on the sidewalk. And, um, you know, we kept in touch. We weren't, we weren't you know, um, the closest of friends at the time, but we, we certainly kept in touch every, every few months. And then mm -hmm. um, when COVID happened uh, or, or went down, we reconnected just to check in and see how everything was going with each other. Um, and it wasn't even through us directly. It was actually through our old CEO, um, Steve, who I mentioned earlier, um, that sort of, you know, told us both, hey, um, you know, when I made the decision that I wanted to see what else was out there, he said, hey, you should talk to Tomo, right? And, and right. I said, oh, of course. And so we, we, we reconnected um, on a professional level at this point. Um, and that was where he told me about finance and how it can play in the e-commerce world with both you know, Amazon sellers and D2C brands and how, right. uh, you know, he introduced me, you know, at the time, um, I had very little insight to the e-commerce world. Um, you know, he, he told me about Thrasio, which, which, you know, um, was an initial investor in the art line and, yeah. and, and understanding how that all went together. And, you know, it, it sort of opened my eyes to a whole nother world that I didn't really think about regularly. I, I knew it existed. I knew that there was some opportunity there. I wasn't really sure about what the opportunity looked like. Right. Um, but again, I, I, I decided, you know, to embrace the change and embrace everything. Um, and during COVID, you know, what better time to, to really focus on e-commerce than mm. um, as opposed to brick and mortar um, that, than, than when that was going Struggling. on. Struggling. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that. see, this, I, I'm learning so much about you, and I love learning, like, all these details about your life, and, you know, and, and the choices that you made, and the influences that you had. What I love about this, as well, is, um, you know, I'm, it seems very clear that something you are very good at, which I think we're learning your wife is maybe not a huge fan of, um, <laughs> is that you're very good at pivoting, right? You're like, what's going to happen is going to happen. When that happens, I can make more choices. And um, that is really a very entrepreneurial way of thinking. And it's a very, um, it's a very agile way of thinking and operating, uh, which I think you, you have to be. Yeah. And, and, and in case she does listen to this, I, I will say I did meet my wife when, when we were at Capitus. So that was around 2018. Oh, early okay. 2018. Um, and, and, and so you know, we met um, online, we met online and it just so happened she, she lived um, more or less across the street in Brooklyn, which was like another planet to me. Cause I, I, I've, you know, as long as I've lived in New York, it's always been in Manhattan. Um, right. So, so, you know, um, we, we started dating 
Um, but the, the chances of her living across the street, essentially from my brother in Brooklyn was, you know, one in a million. And so, uh, you know, that, that was such a, such a coincidence that when we started dating, it made things really easy to being yeah. able to go, go travel that long, long journey from Manhattan to Brooklyn, all of 30 minutes or, or less, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I could, I could babysit my niece and, and, and go on a date at the same time. What's, what's not to love about that? Oh, that's amazing. I love that so much. And what's your wife's name? Do you mind if I ask? Yeah, Lee. Lee, wonderful. I hope that sometime when I come up to New York, we'll all be able to get together and, and uh, hang out some more. Um, sure. So I would love to learn now, um, kind of turning our attention now to Yardline, you guys talked about this and you decided, okay, we're going to do this thing. Um, so now tell us what it looks like today. What does Yardline do and how does it help e-commerce sellers? Yeah, so, so Yardline, which was founded by Tomo and um, uh, uh, he, our, our other co-founder, Ari Horowitz, um, who was an early um, employee at Thrasio. He, uh -huh. he helped put out the M&A team over there at Thrasio early on, um, was, was built with this idea of, okay, how can we take my background and Tomo's background from the traditional small business financing world, as well as the Thrasio model of being able to produce future cash flows of these of these e-commerce sellers and where they're not all looking to sell or they're not all ready to sell yet provide them with the financing needed to get to the next level right so you know 90 plus percent of our clients today are coming to us because they need additional funds for inventory and market right they they're growing they see the writing on the wall they're able to you know easily sell their products because of the amazon ecosystem or because mm. of this you know, shift from, you know, brick and mortar to online sales. Right. And so they're, they're seeing the, the pain points of growth, which is really access to capital. Now, yeah. the really unique thing of what we do at Yardline isn't even so much the financing we offer. I mean, the financing, obviously, that was really where it all started for us was, was deploying capital to sellers. But the really, the really big thing about Yardline, and, and if you go to our trust pilot and you look at our reviews or you talk to our customers, um, most of the conversation isn't even about the capital. It's about us being able to help them operate as sellers and grow their business. So in the same way that Thrasio acquires a business, right, with the goal of scaling that business and growing that business so that they can in turn, you know, see their return on investment sooner. Mm -hmm. um, we know that in the ecosystem of Amazon or even in the ecosystem of online selling in general, there are things you can do to be a better operator. Right. Whether yeah. you're a fully scaled business or you're just starting out, there are so many different components of operating an online business that not everybody has access to the Thrasio power, right? Or, right. or, or the scale of even like a 10 man operation, 10 person operation, right? So yeah. being able to not only tap into our capital resources to help grow their business, but also our expertise through our seller success program, um, that's really what Yardline is focused on today. It's being able to help sellers grow profitably and to win in the e-commerce ecosystem. Oh, I love that. What a great way, you know, to put customers first, to, you know, to be entrepreneurs who are supporting entrepreneurs and to make sure that not only are they taken care of in, um, you know, the financial aspect, but also giving them support and help um, with all of the many other, many, many other um, things that come up in the e-commerce world. So um, Seth, I would like to um, make sure that people can get in touch with you after this. Can you tell them how, how they can find you on social media and um, how they would contact you if they want to check out Yardline? Absolutely. Um, you can visit us on yardline.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Seth Broman, B-R-O-M-A-N. I'm sure it'll be in the, in the podcast writing, but um, you can also email me directly. We're very, we're very communicative with our clients, with our customers, and with our partners. Um, Seth at yardline.com. Excellent. Well, we are at Eva. We are so excited to be partners with with Yardline, and uh, we're really excited for some upcoming plans that we have. So I'm yes. going to have a spoiler alert here for you guys. Uh, keep you know, keep stay tuned. I guess we're going to be um, putting together some really interesting and fun webinars as we head now into 2022. So you guys stay tuned, and we'll we'll give you more information on that. Um, Seth, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure thank to have you. you on today. And I really appreciate your time. I hope that we can do this again. And I'm Absolutely. really looking forward to those uh, webinars that we put together with some panels of experts.
Perfect. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much, Seth. And cheers, you guys. We'll see you next week on Amazon Stream.